And we are back on Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Shanafelt, and I am now joined by University of North Carolina alum. He is a two-time NBA All-Star who is now entering his 18th season in the NBA. He is currently the shooting guard slash small forward for the Brooklyn Nets. He is Jerry Stackhouse. Jerry, how's it going, man? Man, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, Jerry, first I want to start off by, uh, as I said, you attended University of North Carolina. What was it about that school that uh, made you decide to go there? I mean, other than the fact that it was, you know, it was home and I grew up in North Carolina, so it was kind of a natural state. And also, I mean, I was right in the heart of ACC country, so I always felt that I would probably be in you know, doing ACC school. Um, but, but just after leaving that, my, my senior year and going up to Oak Hill for my, for my final year, I thought, you know, I just wanted to come back home and it was just a perfect fit. Uh, they were coming off of a, a national championship, you know, with At one point, many people thought you were going to be the next Michael Jordan. Uh, you both attended University of North Carolina. You were both picked at uh, as the third pick in the NBA draft. And you were both six foot six, and you both had power forward uh, players that were picked right after you guys at the fourth spot. Uh, Sam Perkins was picked right after Jordan, and in 19, uh, that was in 1984. And Rasheed Wallace was picked right after you in 1995. What were you thinking uh, when you would hear the comparisons between Michael Jordan and yourself? No, I never really trained a lot into it. I mean, it was just a you know, kind of fan, and uh, media like having a lot of, you know, saying that. I mean, I was a, a power forward in high school and college. I never even really thought about the shooting guard until I really got to the NBA. So, you know, the guy that I really looked up to as, as far as battering my game was more change worthy and. Uh, Kevin McHale, these are the guys that I, you know, guys that play with their backs to the basket. And uh, so, I mean, as far as the comparison, Michael Jordan, they were just kind of out of the blue for me. I never really paid it, you know, a whole lot of attention. I just knew I was, you know, I, you know, I just love to play basketball and whatever. You know, my talent left me. That's where it would be. And, you know, I mean, obviously it was flattering because it's the best player in the game. But at the same time, you know, and you see now there's a lot of people that try to, you can't compare and who's going to be the next of probably the greatest player that ever played. And you're still going to be hunting for that. So, yeah, you know, so, but I think just from my standpoint, I just wanted to come out and establish myself as a, you know, as a quality NBA player. You know, I all star player, and, and in my mind, I did that. So, all the other comparisons and things that other people had on me really didn't have any effect on me at all. Uh, and Jerry Stackhouse, you were picked third overall by the Philadelphia 76ers in the 1995 NBA draft. Uh, how was that moment for you when you received the phone call letting you know that you were going to be drafted by the 76ers and when you heard the NBA commissioner, David Stern, call your name up to the big stage? Well, I mean, obviously it was excitement. I mean, I felt that there was not, you know, a possibility of me even going as high as, you know, the number one pick, I had a really good workout, you know, at Golden State. I think they were unsure exactly what they were going to do. Uh, you know, Philadelphia pretty much told me if I was around the three that they were going to take me. We got the kind of the same uh, notion from Washington and, and, and Minnesota as well, who had the fifth pick. But uh, I think, so it was just, I knew that I probably wouldn't go past the three. I, I didn't necessarily want to go to the Clippers. I mean, playing on the East Coast, growing up on the East Coast. I didn't want my first few years in the NBA to really be on the West Coast with the Clippers or, you know, if Golden State was the first pick, I would have took it, but I, my purpose was to be back on the East Coast anyway. Mm -hmm. And what was it like to put on an NBA jersey with the la with your last name on it for the first time? Uh, it was excitement. I still get that, that little feeling and a little strut in my step whenever I put on that NBA uniform still right now, you know, 18 years later, you put on that uniform as a sense of, you know, you're one of the top, you know, f you know, three, four hundred players in the, in the world. And so, I mean, I, I, I never get, that never gets old to 
me. But, you know, that very first time was, you know, it was exciting. It was our kind of a dream come true. You know, this is the next step. But with me, it was always on to the next. What's the next thing that I want to accomplish? I want now. I want to really, you know, show that I belong here in place. So those, those little moments, although they're significant, they don't stay with you that long. It's really on to the next thing. And, and that's kind of how my career was, just kind of chasing the next goal and, and, and trying to achieve that next goal. Mm -hmm. You average about 19 points during your rookie season for the 76ers, and then you guys drafted Allen Iverson, where in your sophomore season, you and Iverson combined for 44 points per game for the Sixers. What was it like for you to play with a point guard such as Allen Iverson? Well, it was different because Allen wasn't a true point guard when he came in the league. He had to learn the point guard slot, and actually, you know, really spent most of his career playing the two as well, you know, with, with Derek Snow, you know, pretty much man in the, the point of guard due to he was more of a, you know, playing off the ball. And I mean, ultimately, it may have, could have worked out, but I just think both, you know, everybody around saw that it was two young scorers that kind of needed to have their own space. And, um, you know, so I, I was moved to Detroit where it worked out well for me and, and, and likewise Allen Iverson, but it was just, it was different. When you come in with two young guys who are trying to establish themselves, and we were basically the best two players on the team at that. You know, most young guys come to the teams now, they're not the best players on the team. So, I mean, so we, it was a lot of growing pains, a lot of losses, but, you know, we look back on it and, and laugh about, you know, the, the times we had, not so much of winning, but just kind of the times we had away from basketball as well, just kind of growing into who we were. All right, and as you said, midway through your third season with the Sixers, you're traded to the De uh, Detroit Pistons. Uh, did you expect to be traded? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was almost like our welcome. So it was the second year. We got through the first year, then into the second year. I mean, we had Johnny Davis, who was a first-time coach, who was you know, a little bit overwhelming to, to deal with you know, the type of personality that we had in our locker room as a, as a first-year coach. And... Um, Second, you know, the second year we had Larry Brown, and you know, I was you know, starting to turn a little bit from the standpoint of a winning philosophy, but you know, just just didn't work out. And I think they were looking for some pieces to kind of show up their their front line, and you know, Bill Ratliff came available, and it was uh, a good fit for me in Detroit. So I mean, my agent has been we've been talking for it, but I didn't know if it would actually go down. You never know with trades whether they're gonna go through or not, but. I felt like it was, you know, ultimately probably happened with this 40 year was over after the season was over, and it did. And I got to Detroit, and it was you know, a good space. It was an adjustment going to to Detroit. You know, that, that, that initial trade, the first trade, it, it wakes you up. It's definitely an eye opener. I'm like, you know, really got to lock in and focus in to on what I want to accomplish, and you know, it was good. I think, you know, I, I still personally feel like everybody at least once. I think it just kind of helps you realign what you need to do and refocus on what you need to do basketball-wise, and it did that for me. After a few years playing with the Pistons, you set a career-high average of 29.8 points per game. What do you think was a few things that helped you reach that career-high average? Um, well, I, mean, I guess it was just uh, that year we just lost Grant. There was a lot was forced on me to be the primary scorer. And uh, so just kind of almost by default, I mean, I think I was averaging right around 22, 23. That's, that's a respectful number when you got an all-star caliber player playing alongside of you. But, you know, when he left, it just, you know, opened up for a few more opportunities for me to be able to put the ball in the basket. And uh, it was fun. You know, so it was fun being able to be the focal point of the team and what we were, you know, what we were doing. And uh, going forward, you know, I was just like, you know, I, I can do this. I feel like I can carry a team. I can push a team to um, another level. And um, so it was, it was a good thing. It was, uh, you know, being recognized as one of the top scorers in the league for, you know, for a number of years. It's you know, always good. It's just good for your confidence. Basketball is a game of confidence. And when you're able to do things like that amongst the top players in the world, then you just, your confidence is going to grow. 
<laughs> During the 2002 offseason, you were traded again, this time to the Washington Wizards in a six-player deal. In Washington, you continued to lead the team you played for, this time with 21 and a half points per game and 4.5 rebounds. In the 2003 through 2004 season, you only played in 26 games and then you had to uh, have knee surgery. What was it like to sit out for most of the season and watch your team uh, not not have much success as they went uh, 25 and 57 that season? Yeah, it was, uh, it was tough, but I felt that, you know, obviously being out there probably could have helped change that a little bit, but it was pretty times they had been down for a while watching them, and those, those Washington years, kind of like years you just wouldn't want to forget because it was uh, injury-prone years for me. I had a, uh, not a major surgery, but a significant surgery that caused me to miss a lot of time. Um, after my initial year, you know, the first year, you know, playing Michael Jordan and uh, that team, you know, coming short of making the playoffs, and then I, I re-signed back there, and uh, next year I had to have a surgery before we even started the season for my for my knee, and uh, so it was, it was just tough, kind of a tough situation, a lot of change, uh, a lot of coaching change, GM changes there, and you know. Ownership changes. So it was a weird dynamic in, in Washington, to say the least. But, you know, from there, I was able to get to, to Dallas and somewhere get healthy again and get back on the court. And that was, that was probably what I looked at, probably some of the better years of my career playing in Dallas as well. Yeah, as you said, after that season, you were traded to the Dallas Mavericks along with Christian Leitner and Devin Harris in exchange for former Tar Heel and NBA All Star Anton Jameson. In Dallas, you played the role of the sixth man and played in the 2005-2006 NBA Finals as you guys took on the Miami Heat. And you were actually suspended for Game 5 uh, 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 for a flagrant foul you committed on Shaq. Looking back, do you agree with the consequences you took from that foul? Well, no, I don't agree with it, but it was what happened, so it's, you know, it is what it is. Uh, obviously, I would tell that that could have been a difference in a one- or two-point game that we lost in Game 5 that could have you know, changed the whole outcome of the playoffs and, and the, the final results, but you know, it is what it is. The, those plays are part of basketball. There's other situation and key things that happen during the, during the playoff series. Not one factor is a controlling factor why you win or lose a series. So, uh, you know, and personally, I, I look back at that moment, but for other people, it's, you know, it's just, you know, Miami Heat won the series that year. We had a 2-0 lead and, and lost it, you know, and lost control of the series. So, I mean, that's more of what I deal with. As far as looking back at the, you know, the opportunity that we had and anything else, just the fact that we were, we were up, you know, and, and two zero in the seven game series and, and they wasn't able to close it out. Right, you guys were on to lose a series four to two. Can you tell me what the Dallas Mavericks locker room was uh, was like after uh, that game six in Miami loss? Um, uh, it's obviously. Yeah, I mean, you guys probably could answer that question yourself. You know what I mean, man? It's, 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 you're at the pinnacle of, of sports and, you know, playing in the finals of, of your respective sport and you lose, uh, and you lose. So, I mean, obviously, there was a lot of disappointment, a lot of, uh, just, you know, feeling like you could wish you know, work it out of time more, everybody. So, I mean, I think that's, that's part of it. But you have to take your hands off to so yeah, it's off to, to the team that wanted to get ready to shoot them up and next year, which we did and came out and had a great regular season. And, um, 
You were with the Mavericks for five total seasons until you were traded to the Grizzlies. You were weighed by them and then was signed uh, by the Milwaukee Bucks where you played with a very talented rookie point guard in Brandon Jennings who early in his rookie season dropped 55 points in just three quarters because he didn't score any points in that first quarter of the game against Golden State. Uh, that 55 points is now a team record for most points scored by a rookie in a game. What was it like to watch that performance unfold? I didn't. I wasn't there yet. Oh. I, mean, I joined the team in January, so I didn't actually see the performance. But uh, Brandon Jennings is a, you know, he's a dynamic you know, point guard who has the ability to score the ball and make plays. I mean, I was, I was really impressed playing with him. My, uh, you know, his rookie year, just for a guy being as young as he was, he wasn't a you know, real high turnover guy. He really protected the ball. And that's what a lot of, a lot of young guys struggle with. Uh, young guys struggle with when they come into the league. But I think, you know, I think otherwise, he, you know, he, he, you know, he ran the team well. And, you know, honestly, they struggled a little bit the last couple of years, but he, he's going to be fine. All right, let's fast forward to the 2011 season as you were signed by the Atlanta Falcon. Uh, wow, Atlanta Hawks. As you guys went on to uh, only play 66 games to the, due to the NBA lockout, you guys went 40 and 26. How was it like to play 16 seasons in the NBA with 81 games in a season, and then having last season shortened by 15 games and starting the season in December? How was it? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it is what it is, man. You as basketball players, we learn to adjust. We don't think about so much what is the what's happening. Uh, you know, with, with what the schedule is going. I remember one year we had a 50 game season, and then, like I said last year, was a shortened season. We just glad to get back playing basketball. A lot of guys would have really been in a bad spot if they wasn't been uh, in basketball play last season. A lot of people would have lost their jobs. So our, our main thing was just trying to get back on the court, trying to savage the season as much as we can. I mean, putting a little more pressure on us to, you know, get, get our set bodies up for a shortened season and with a lot of, you know, games compacted in between that. That was just part of what it was. So we were, we were just happy to be back playing and I thought the season, you know, for it to be a shortened season turned out to be great playoffs and, you know, we avoided having too many major injuries. There was a couple of bad knee injuries there. You know, Derek Rose being one of them and get from New York Shepard, but uh, for the most part, I think we, you know, got out, the, got through that season of skating, and hopefully guys can come back with a full off season, a full training camp, and be ready to roll. Jerry, just last month you signed with the Brooklyn Nets, where you'll be playing alongside Darren Williams and Joe Johnson and many other talented players. Uh, I know this might be difficult to answer, but what do you think your role will look like as you play for uh, the Nets? Just whatever the coach asked me to do. I mean, I just think that's the approach that everybody on the team has to come in, and that's kind of my one of my roles. I know is to make sure that everybody's on the same page. They're going after and 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 working at their hardest to accomplish whatever role that they were decided that, that it is for the team, and that could change on the course of the year. Could change on the course of a game. And I just think the the teams that have the players that are willing to do that are the ones that have success. I mean, I. I've seen it too many times. I've seen, you know, obviously the other side of it too. Teams that that players have their own agendas and what they want to accomplish, and not aligned with the team goals. You know, you have bad seasons and and, and sometimes not even playoff seasons. So we want to avoid all that. We think we have a talented, talented team, a group that you know everybody's back in the fold. Going to be back in the fold for a while and going to be able to kind of grow together. So. We're excited about that, and uh, like I said, the roles are, the roles will take care of themselves. Right, this is their, this is going to be the first season the Nets will be in Brooklyn. Uh, just over the seasons, they haven't been in the playoffs for a while, and now they are predicted to be in the playoffs. Can we get we're any predictions? Talking, man. I mean, I mean what, what's going on in the past? We're talking fresh. This is the inaugural season of the Brooklyn Nets. You know, we ain't thinking about anything that's happened. It's almost like every the slate's been wiped clean for, for the Nets franchise. We're starting fresh with a new group of guys, and I'm pretty sure that's going to be the last. The, the, the Avery and, you know, Billy King kind of displayed to the team. This is an opportunity to, to, to set a precedent going forward in a new city with a new fan base. And I uh, see what happens. So, and I think we, you know, they put together a very, very good team for the chance of, of, of you know, really garnering some, some support from the city. And it's, 
four million people in Fort Fred. I'm pretty sure not all of them are going to lock into being uh, Knicks fans now that, that, the, that the Nets started from the Nets are, are, are alive and well. Hey, I hear you on that one. And, uh, Jerry, I just have a few kind of random and out there questions for you to answer, then I'll let you go. I really do appreciate your time. I'm going to start off with growing up, who was your favorite NBA team and player? I was a Lakers. I was a Showtime fan. I mean, I probably, I mean, I love Magic, but probably James Worthy was my, my favorite player growing up. I was, uh, you know, those are the games that I, I saw. You know, we had cable TV and all that. So we were just, you know, Channel 9, you know, at the church. That was what was happening, only the Lakers and, and the Celtics. And, you know, I was, I was a big, big Lakers fan. And as we know, if it wasn't for you contacting me back, I wouldn't have you on the show tonight. So I must ask you, why do you make it important to interact with your fans? Well, I, mean, you know, I just think it's, you, know, you, you came to me with a, a genuine request, and then uh, you, know, you can't really try to everybody and every, you know, and get to everybody. But for most people, I try to be accommodating too. So I mean, that's just part of our business and what we do. Uh, you got to be accessible and. and Kind of share, and I, I pick and choose my times to do that. I don't sit around the clock on the on the phone waiting to, to do interviews, but at the same time, when um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm excited about what's about to happen with, with that team I'm starting to starting to smell training camp around the corner. So let's talk some basketball. I'm all all, all, all with it. Cool, cool. Uh, Jerry, do you have some kind of ritual or something you do before every game? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I like to get a massage, you know, during the day, or at least, you know, before the game. Uh, started lifting a little bit more as I got older before games. Trying to just make sure my body was respected. When you're not playing as much, got to make sure you keep your body right just in case, you know, you're called upon, you're out there ready. And I think that's what a lot of young guys uh, tend to not do. You know, when they're not playing, they, they tend to neg you know, neglect their, their workload. So, I mean, you got to maintain that workload. So once you're thrown out there and get, get an opportunity that you don't drop the ball, no pun intended. So that's, that's kind of where it's at. All right, Jerry, what's your favorite TV show uh, and or movie? Um, I, I got a couple of different, but I like, uh, I like Boss. Boss is one of the I like Boston, the show Boss. I like uh, um, Dallas, you know, the, the series that just came out from the old, old spinoff of, of the Dallas series. I've been mean, enjoying that. So, um, I mean, but, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm a TV buff pretty much. Probably my favorite movie of all time is a, is a few good men. You know, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. So that, that's, that's probably where I'm at on the movie TV tip. Alright, and last but not least, what is something about Jerry Sackhouse that many people do not know? Mm. I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm an avid boater. You know, I guess it's probably about a lot of people not know that. I love the boat, love the fish. Really, you know, when in my spare time, that's what I'm doing. Kind of out on, out on the lake, or out on in the ocean somewhere with my family, enjoying my my time and enjoying the water. That's yeah. Hey, that sounds good to me. That, that sounds good to me. Jerry, thank you so much for your time, man. Is there anything you would like to uh, plug on the air for our listeners? No, nah, man. Just, I'm just excited to you know, get ready to get this thing started in Brooklyn. I mean, I know it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of hard work. Hopefully, everybody come in with that approach and we, you know, go get it in. So, I'm just excited. Hope the fans are excited, too. Sounds good. Uh, Jerry, thanks again, and I wish you the best of luck this, this season. Take care, man.